Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well. Today is Wednesday. It is the 8th of, of March. It's also Shushan Purim. It is the 15th day of Adar. So we had a beautiful Purim yesterday. And in Yerushalayim and in other cities that had a wall from the time of Yoshua ben Nun, they're celebrating today Shushan Purim. Since it is Shushan Purim and we're fresh off of Purim, I thought it would be wonderful to not let Purim go. And I wanted to share with you some beautiful ideas that I saw from the Chida, Rav Chaim Yosef David Azulai, that relate to Megillas Esther. And since we're still feeling the aura of Purim, I think it would be really appropriate, especially that today is Shushan Purim, and many of us, like me, may have sore throats from too much singing yesterday. So we're still in the Purim mood. So therefore, I want to I want to share some great Devere Torah with you. I want to preface this by saying, I only heard of this chida, the idea that I'm going to share with you, the main kernel of it. I only heard of it last week. In a shir from Rabbi Yisrael Reisman in Brooklyn, he quoted this chida, totally new to me. I had never heard of this Devere Torah before, but it was awesome. I shared some of this with young Israel at Shalashudas on Shabbos, and I want to share more because I've, I've done some research since Shalashudas. I uncovered some more answers, and I want to share this with you. So let's see. So just a brief bio first on the Chida. There's no way to know for certain that that artist's rendition is accurate or not, but it's very, very common that when you look up anything with the Chida, this artist rendition comes up. I don't know if this was drawn during his lifetime or not, but the Chida is a fascinating figure. Here's a brief bio that I found on the OU's website. So Rav Chaim Yosef David Azulai, you see, you'll see in a minute, that's actually an acronym for Chida. That's why he's always known as the Chida. The Chida lived in the late 1700s. We'll get a date at the bottom. So this was from, a, as I said, the OU's website. Chida was one of the most fascinating, multifaceted figures in Jewish history. Born in Jerusalem, he became a scholar of the first rank and wrote classic works in Halacha, such as Shar Yosef, Birke Yosef, and Machzik Bracha. He was associated with the Kabbalist of Shalom Sharabi and studied under Rav Chaim Ibn Atar, that was the Or Hachaim, I believe. In 1753, at the age of 29, he traveled to Europe as an emissary of the communities of Eretz Yisrael, and again in 1772 on behalf of Hebron. Each trip lasted in excess of five years. He completed his second trip in Leghorn, where he remained for the rest of his life. That's where he passed away as well. <clears throat> they reinterred him to uh, to Israel. I believe he's buried on Haram Enuchos. They built a beautiful O.L., over his cavern. Uh, it's, I would, next time I'm at Harmanuchos, I want to visit that. Wherever he visited, Chida made sure to inspect the important libraries and thus came familiar with many thousands of manuscripts. Out of these visits grew his remarkably compact and informative classic bibliographic biographic work, Shem HaGadolim. I have that here at home. In all, he wrote about 100 volumes in every field of scholarship. Over and above his learning, Chida was a radiant, impressive, yet remarkably modest personality. This shines through in the detailed diary of his trips, Ma'agal Tov. I have, by the way, an English translation of, of those trips. Fascinating, because as we said, he took two trips raising funds for Eretz Yisrael, first on behalf of Yerushalayim and then Hebron, and each of those trips lasted about five years. He took very detailed notes of those trips. So, for example, he talks about where he spent uh, um, Shabbos. He talks about spending a Shabbos with the Pnei Yoshua in Germany. He talks about visiting London and, and seeing the zoo there. All these things, which are just fascinating, he writes down and, and he records. And uh, there's some uh, there's real halachic material in there because he writes about when he visits the zoo, what brachas he made upon seeing certain animals. Fascinating. Okay, I'm sorry, I got off script. Let's go back to the OU. This shines through in his detailed diary of his trips, Ma'agal Tov. Uh, he attributes all of the honor he received to the fact that he represented the Holy Land and does not take insults lightly as they may reflect on the honor of Eretz Yisrael. He was interested and absorbed by all that he saw and heard in the many places he traveled and was curious to learn about the new and exotic. He was careful not to insult anyone, to avoid controversy. He studied Musr, that's Jewish ethics, regularly and was always working to improve his character. He complained of those who only studied Talmud and Poskin, did not sufficiently appreciate the study of Tanakh, Mishnah, and Musr. Chida learned of his wife's passing while in Tunis and was forced to conceal her death for fear the community would force him to remarry. Mourning in solitude, he wrote that she was perhaps unique in the generation 
wisdom, honor, powerful and awesome intellect, grace, beauty, great modesty, and extraordinary cleanliness. So the Chida is an absolutely fascinating personality. And again, he was living in the late 1700s. That was a generation and that was a time of giants. There were so many, many Jewish giants at that time. And to even get noticed at a time like that tells you what kind of what kind of uh, incredible personality he must have been. Here's just something from the Wikipedia. You can just see the exact dates of his birth and death. Chaim Yosef David Azulai and Yitzchak Zerachia, not Zacharia, but Zerachia. So he lived from 1724. He was born in Yerushalayim, we said, and he passed away in 1806, I believe, in Leghorn. So you see his name there is Chaim Yosef David Azulai, commonly known as Chida. That's the acronym of his name, Chida. Was a Jerusalem-born rabbinical scholar, a noted bibliophile, and a pioneer in the publication of Jewish religious writings. Okay, that's we've got some bio on the Chida. Let me share with you a work I found online. This is called Migilas Esther in Perushe Maran HaChida. So, as we said, the Chida was a prolific author. He wrote so many Sfarim. He wrote Jerushas. He wrote Halachic works. He works wrote works on Megillah. So, I found this work online in a, in a database I belong to. And this is a collection. The one who compiled this work searched high and low, and he found uh, anything in the Chida's writings that pertain to Megillah's Esther, and he collected them all together so they could be in one volume. So I, I was not aware of this work. I was aware of a work he wrote called Nachal Eshkol, which was on Megillus, uh, on the five Megillas. And of course, there's one section on Megillus Esther. So when I started doing my homework, all of a sudden I realized this was here and we'll see, this is going to help us find more answers to a question that he raises. So this is a collection of his commentaries and it's cold from his many writings, but as they pertain to Megillus Esther. So let's see, we're going to jump right in. This is in the ninth parak, chapter nine. Perak Tess and Megillus Esther. So again, this is after the incredible turnaround takes place. So uh, Mordechai and Esther were successful in overturning Haman's plot. Remember, they couldn't eradicate, they couldn't erase the letters, the original letters that went out that called for doomsday against the Jews. But what they could do was issue a new set of letters that allowed the Jews to rise up and fight their enemies. So the Pasuk says here, it is in Perak Tess, Pasuk Chav Zayin, so all the Jews ordained and they took upon themselves and upon descendants and anyone who had ever joined them and they said everybody has the responsibility everybody has to take these days according to their script according to their appointed time every year it's incumbent upon all of us to observe Purim Chavches 28. And these days will be remembered and celebrated. Oh, I'm sorry, if someone's not muted, would you mind muting yourself? We, we hear the background noise. And they are remembered and they're celebrated throughout every generation by every family. And then it says, and every province, every state, every city. And the days of Purim shall not be revoked from amongst B'nai Yisrael, amongst all the Jews. And their memory shall not cease from their seed. So what the Pasuk is telling us is that B'nai Yisrael were so awed by everything that had occurred in, in Purim that Jews around the world decided that this holiday is going to be part and parcel of the Jewish calendar and it, it will be observed year after year after year. And that's why we observed Purim yesterday. That's why in Yerushalayim, Purim is being observed today. Because of these Pesukim in the Megillah. Worldwide, Jewry felt incumbent upon themselves to take this on. And we have a new day added to our Jewish calendar. This was seen and it was, it was met with universal agreement. That's what the Pasuk tells us. Comes along the Chida and he asks an awesome question. So again, I saw this, what you're seeing here on the next page, this is page three. What you're seeing on page three is a collection in that book that we saw that was, that called together all the writings of the Chida that pertain to Megillah Esther. You'll see the first column on the right, 
I'm just scrolling down. You see at the bottom, it says, it's taken in parentheses. It says from Nachal Eshkol. That was the source that I knew of before last Shabbos. That, that Nachal Eshkol is the commentary that the Chida wrote on Megillah. So you're going to see there, that was all I was aware of going into Shabbos. And this is what I mentioned at at Young Israel, at Shalashudas. And this is what I heard Rabbi Reisman talk about last week. Let's see. He says he's going on that Pasuk, Medina, Medina, Be'ir, Be'ir, that, that Jews around the world, in every city, and every province, that in every everywhere you go, they all said, we are going to celebrate Purim. And this celebration of Purim, it will never cease from being celebrated amongst Bnei Israel. Okay. Comes along the Chida, the column on the right, and he says as follows. Efshir Lomar, we, I want to put forth the following idea. The Chakira Achas, I want to raise a question. Shechakarnu bedrushim. In in all of our, I guess, in in it's, it's an expression of humility, saying in my poor state, this is a question that I raised in my drushos. He had a, a sefer of drushos, and that's where this was originally raised. And in his commentary to Megillah, this Nachal Eshkol, this is where he's saying, I'm repeating now something I've raised in my original drushos. Again, I wasn't able to find it in the original drushos, but this is fine. Let's see what he says. She'are Sfarad, there were cities in Sfarad, Sfarad means Spain, the Africa, and there were also cities in Africa, Lohayu Tachas Memshelas Achashverosh. They were not under the rule of Achashverosh, meaning they were outside of the Persian Empire. There were Jews at the time of the Purim story who were living as far away as Sfarad, as Spain. That's wild. And in Africa, we're going to soon see he means Mitzrayim in Egypt. Egypt wasn't under the rule of the Persian Empire. And Spain certainly wasn't under the rule of this of the Persian Empire. And he says, they were not under the rule of Achashverosh. Kilo Melach Ella Al Kuchav Zayin Medinos. Achashverosh only ruled over 127 uh, provinces, states. That was the Persian Empire. Bimkain Hatenach Li Yisrael. Asher Hayu BeMedinos Malchus Achashverosh. I understand full well why is it that any Jew who was living in the 127 provinces of Achashverosh, I understand why they took on Purim. Their lives were at risk, and then they were saved. We need to celebrate, and we need to celebrate with Purim. I get that. So he says, I understand very well why any Jew who was living in the, in the empire of Achashverosh, I understand why they celebrated, and they took on the responsibility to have Purim as part and parcel of their uh, uh, of their calendar. It makes sense for them to celebrate Purim for the length, for as long as the world lives. Haman had decreed to annihilate them. They faced doomsday. But what happened? There was the turnaround, and they're here. So we've got reason to celebrate, and we've got reason to be thankful for all generations, because we wouldn't be here if Haman was successful. Amnam Yisrael Shibare Sfarad Africa. But there were Jews at that time who were living in Spain and were living on the continent of Africa, meaning Mitzrayim, we'll soon see later in Egypt. Asher lo nigzar aleyem. Haman's decree never hit them. They were not subject to Haman's decree. Mi chayavam lasos purim. So what, who, who, who made them required? What made them required or feel compelled to celebrate Purim and to take it on as a as a yearly obligation. I'm going to just pause. I want to get a safer off my bookshelf. So that, this is the Chida's question. What the Chida's asking is as follows. Is the Chida's asking a very, a very logical question. He wants to know that, granted, it makes perfect sense why any Jew who is living in the Persian Empire why they celebrated Purim those first years, and why all their descendants that come after them would always celebrate Purim. We've got a lot to be thankful for. But any Jew who was living in Sfarad or in Mitzrayim at the time of the Purim story, living outside the Persian Empire, th their lives were never at risk. So then why is it incumbent upon them? Why did they take on Purim and making it incumbent on all their descendants? Excellent question. Now, if you stop and think about it, I never thought about it that at the time of the Perm story, there were Jews living outside of the Persian Empire. 
But the Chida is taking that for granted. Not all the Jews at the time of the Purim story, <coughs> he's writing, were living in the Persian Empire. There were Jews in Mitzrayim, and he says there were Jews in Sfarad. Where do you get such an idea? Well, you don't need to look too far to find proof for that. If you remember, a few weeks ago, the Haftarah for Parshas Vayishlach, we read from Sefer Ovadja. In fact, we didn't read from Sefer Ovadja. We read the entire Sefer Ovadja. I know I used to love announcing this when we lived in Pennsylvania. I would announce the Haftarah and I would always say, for today's Haftarah, we're going to read the entire Sefer Ovadja. And people start getting nervous. And then what they don't realize is the entire Sefer Ovadja is one chapter consisting of 21 psukim. So it's not as scary as it sounds. But in Parshas of Ayishlach, we read Sefer Ovadja as the Haftorah. And in the second to last Pasuk, we say as follows. In, in Pasuk Chaf, the 20th Pasuk in Ovadja, we say, Yisrael. So Ovadja is prophesizing about in the future times when there's an ingathering of the exiles. He says all those Jewish exiles who had been sent out far to far-flung places, he says, there are some Asher Kananim Ad Sarfas, there are some who are with the Kananim, and they're as far away as Sarfas. Sarfas in modern Hebrew is how you say France. And Rashi, right there on the Pasuk, says, Vahaposrim, some who interpret this Pasuk, how do they say Sarfas? He says, Belaz and Lashon Amzar, how do they say it in the vernacular? He says, in the vernacular, they call it France. Uh, France. So he says there were Jews living together with Canaanim. And according to some of the commentaries here, there were Canaanim who left the land of Canaan, left the land, what would become Israel. Once Yoshua came marching in with the armies of Bnei Israel, some of them fled and they went to Europe. So the Pasuk here is saying in Ovadja, there are Jewish exiles who are living as far away together with some Canaanim. They're living as far away as France. And then the Pasuk says, V'galus Yerushalayim, and there are also the exiled of Jerusalem, meaning the ones who were kicked out of Israel with Aser Sashvatim. There are some Jews originally from Yerushalayim, Asher B'Sfarad, who are as far as away as Sfarad. And the Targum translates, what is Sfarad? The Targum says it means Aspamia. Aspamia is how you say Spain. So he's saying that there are exiled Jews who are living away as far as Sarfas, as far as France, and as far as Aspamia, as far as Spain. Now there is a comment. There is a dis, there's a dispute amongst the commenters. Is Ovadia talking about at during uh, the Gullus of Bias Rishon during the first exile that there were Jews in those far flung places, or is he giving a vision of what's going to happen be Moshe Mashiach before the Messianic era? There will be Jews in those far flung places and they'll come back and they'll move into the southern parts of Israel. So so there is a dispute, but according to many of the commenters, many of the Mefarshim say he's talking about. Uh, Gullus Babel. He's talking about that even during the Babylonian exile, there were Jews living in those far-flung places. And the Chida seems to be learning like that. So what the Chida is saying, if you remember, when did the Perm story take place? It's taking place at the end of Gullus Babel. It's before the second Jewish commonwealth. It's before the Ezra and Nehemiah brought everyone back to rebuild the second base of Migdash. So the Chida is siding with those opinions that say there were Jews living in these far-off places, even during Gullus Babel. So that means during the Purim story, not every Jew in the world was living in the Persian Empire. If you weren't living in the Persian Empire, what reason did you have to celebrate Purim? And if you didn't have a reason to celebrate Purim because your life wasn't spared, so then why did it become incumbent upon their children? Why is Purim a universal Jewish holiday? That's the Chida's question. Awesome question. I never really thought about it before. I never, I, I really, I never did. So let's see what he answers. His first answer is what I shared with uh, young Israel Shal Shuris. Rabbi Nisan was there, and I told him, Rabbi Nisan, this one's for you because this is mu- this is totally up your alley. This is not the uh, genre of Jewish thought that that uh, that me that I usually go down because I'm just these aren't the farm that I normally look at. What you're going to see quoted in a second, but it's beautiful, and this is an authentic piece of Yiddishkeit here. It's just not something I'm all that familiar with. Rabbi Nisan got a good laugh out of that. So let's see. What is the Chidah's first answer? So the Chidah says, I'm back in that first column. Last word on the line, he says, Visham Kasavnu, there, meaning in my Drashos, where I first raised this question, there we wrote, Liashev, how do you answer this? Kapiyani has died to become upon him. I gave several approaches how to answer this. So, so here he's going to record the first one. And in the next column, he'll quote two more approaches. So he says, what's his first approach? 
The first way we're going to deal with this is al pisod. Sod means mystery, meaning Kabbalistic. This is a mystical teaching that's going to explain this. The Yadua, it's well known. Now, he's going to use some words here that I don't know fully how to translate, but you'll see what the gist of it is. The Yadua, it's well known. Whenever there is a Jewish festival, Misgalim Oros Elyonim, great spiritual lights from the heavens are revealed. Somehow or another, the heavenly, the Mechitzos HaShemayim, the heavenly curtains open up and great auras, great spiritual lights are revealed. It's not something that's perceptible to the eye. However, our souls can tap into it. So there are powerful spiritual positive forces that are unleashed at the Moadei Hashem, whenever there's a Yom Tov. Yiskalim Oros El Yonim, upper lights from the Shemaim are released. But Pesach, Gedole Gedolam. On Pesach, there's a, a spiritual energy that's released called Gedole Gedolam. It means the greatest of the great. Without Saras on Shavuos, Golas HaKoseras. I don't know what that term is. It's a Kabbalistic term. There's another spiritual force that's released on, on Shavuos. Uvechag and on Sukkos, Chaste Hashem. A different spiritual energy that's released is called Chaste Hashem. But nonetheless, these are all spiritual energies that you can tap into. The Gam Bepurim. And what do you? What does this also mean? That on Purim, Tzarech Lomar Shiyeshno, the Esther, I don't know, he's using an acronym. There's some type of spiritual power that was unleashed on Purim. And it wasn't a one-time event. All the Yom Tovim, it wasn't a one-time event that just when we left Egypt, the spiritual power of Pesach was revealed. And at Matan Torah, Shavuos, the first Shavuos, that's when the spiritual power of Shavuos was revealed. Then it took us. No, each and every year, once Hashem unleashes those spiritual uh, lights, it's a continuum. Every year when that Chag rolls around, those spiritual energies uh, and lights are released again that we could tap into. Every year when it rolls around on the calendar, those spiritual um, lights shine forth once again. And that's why Kriyas Mo'adenu, again, these are acronyms of some Kabbalistic terms. That's why we call this our Mo'adim. Uvepurim, Lahatzil Yisrael Nizgalis Ha'oral Yona. And on Purim, when all of Bnei Yisrael was saved, he says, it must be that Hashem uh, shot forth a spiritual light from the greatest upper heights. And he quotes some Pasuk and Kohelis. Again, I don't understand how that ties into to this Kabbalistic term he was using. But he says, but there must have been, if Bnei Yisrael, if there was a Hatzalah of this magnitude, if there was a salvation of this degree, there must have been powerful spiritual energies that were released. The cuss of Arizal, and what is the great Kabbalist Ari? What does he write? She says, Sod, the Zikram Lo Yosef Mizaram. That's what the Pasuk means in the Megillah when it says, Vizikram, in their memory, Lo Yosef Mizaram will never be forgotten from the children. What does that mean? That means that every year the Arizal and other Kabbalists taught, every time the calendar rolls around and Pesach returns, we have access to that spiritual energy of Pesach. Whenever Shavuos comes around, we again have access to the spiritual powers of Shavuos. When Sukkot comes around, we could tap into that spiritual light. And when Purim comes around, massive spiritual forces must have been released if we experience a Hatzalah, a salvation of that degree. And every year when Purim rolls around, we could tap into it again. And that's what Arizal says. She says, Sod v'zikram lo yosef mizaram. That that spiritual energy will never be extinguished from our kids. Meaning each year in Purim, we could tap into it again. Emer Meata. So what do we get from this? Meachar de Purim Miskalis Ha'ora Zuba Shemaim. Now since I'm Purim, when Bnei Israel, anyone in the Persian Empire was saved, there was this incredible amount of spiritual energy that was released from heaven. In Ken Chayavim Kol Yisrael. That's why any Jew who was alive at that time and realized that when they read the paper and they realized that, oh my gosh, all of Bnei Yisrael in the Persian Empire was saved. That means an incredible spiritual light came forward. That means any Jew, even not in the Persian Empire, said, I want in on this. I want to tap in on that spiritual energy. And they said, therefore, we're going to require our kids to celebrate Purim, do the mitzvahs of Purim, because that will enable them to tap into that spiritual energy. In came Chayavim Kol Yisrael. That's why all Jews, even those Jews who were not living in the Persian Empire, they were never under the, domin the, the, the dominion of Achashverosh. All of them are required. Just like all the Jews living in the Persian Empire have to observe it, 
So all the Jews outside the Persian Empire voluntarily said, we're going to observe this too, because we want to tap into that spiritual energy. The only way to tap into it is through the mitzvahs of Purim. So we're accepting it upon ourselves, willingly accepting the mitzvahs of Purim and the Yom Tov of Purim on ourselves to enable us to tap into that spiritual power of Purim. Because that's what the Pasuk means um, when it says, uh, what does that mean? Every generation, since that spiritual energy of Purim rolls around each and every year, that's why our ancestors, in their the fact that they were receptive to that spiritual energy, even those living outside of of the Persian Empire realized something awesome is going on. We want in on this. We want our kids and our descendants in on this. So they said, we're making Purim obligatory. This way we also could do the mitzvahs of Purim and we too could tap into the spiritual energy that was revealed through the Hatzalah, through the salvation of Purim. So that's what he says there. Even those states, provinces, and cities that were outside the Persian Empire, that's why they said, we want in on this, and they obligated their kids and all their descendants to celebrate Purim to enable everybody to get to, to, to the opportunity, the spiritual opportunity that Purim has to offer. And that's what the Pasuk means when it says, we made Purim, v'zichram lo yasuf mizaram. And their memory will never be extinguished, will never be forgotten from their descendants. Shusoda Purim. That's the whole mystical background to Purim, Klomar. The Misgalas Ha'ara Ravazu, the revelation of the great spiritual light that, that, that God allowed to shine forth on Purim because all of B'nai Yisrael accepted on ourselves the Yom Tov of Purim. Everybody has access to tap into that. Since everyone has access to it, our aunt, even the ancestors outside the Persian Empire say we want in on this, so they made Purim obligatory for everyone. That's how the Chida, in that answer, this mystical answer, how he answers this question. Beautiful. He's saying that, that, that that's that's the reason why everybody, every Jew, even those outside the Persian, I never stopped and thought about that. There weren't Jews outside the Persian Empire. So the Chidah says, of course, there were Jews outside the Persian Empire. They were in Mitzrayim. They were in Sfarad. There were Jews outside. Again, what did they do in Bayashani? As far as we know, they returned to Eretz Yisrael. We do know there were some communities that have a Misora and that there were outposts that stayed Chutz Laaretz during Bayashani. They, they, they were in touch with Eretz Yisrael. But for the most part, everyone who, who we know of who retained a connection to Judaism returned or sent back majority of their communities to return and uh, kept close in touch with Eretz Yisrael there. But whatever the case may be, everybody bought into Purim, even though not everybody was under the direct threat of Haman. And why? Because of the spiritual energies. Everybody realized this is awesome. We want part of this. That's why Purim is obligatory upon everyone, even the descendants of those Jews who never were at risk during the Purim story. That's the first way the Chida deals with this. It's a very mystical approach and and I told him this to Rabbi Nisan. He loved it, but he was smiling ear to ear when, when I told him that uh, this is, you know, I'm stepping out of my comfort zone into his here. But at the same token, th th it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And what I added to this too is, so new, how do we tap into that light? By fulfilling all the mitzvahs of Purim. There's four unique mitzvahs of Purim. There's the mitzvah of Megillah, both at night and the day. There's the mitzvah of Matanas Lavionim, sharing gifts with the, the disadvantaged. There's Mishloach Manos, building that camaraderie by sending food packages to one another. And then there's Su'uda slash Mishnah, having a festive meal and making merry on Purim. If we really go out of our way to fulfill those four mitzvahs, that's what all of Klai Yisrael said we want in on. And even the Jews who are not living in the Persian Empire said, we're going to observe those mitzvahs too. Why? Because we want to tap into that spiritual energy, meaning those mitzvahs of Purim, that's the key. That's the way to tap into the spiritual energy. So hopefully we all were Mekayim, we fulfilled those mitzvahs to the utmost, and we were all successful at tapping into that spiritual energy of Purim, which is the whole reason why even Jews outside the Persian Empire made this made that day incumbent upon themselves to, to observe and to fulfill the mitzvahs. That's answer number one that the Chida gives. He's going to give us two more. Let's look at the top of the left column. This is from another one of the Chida's farm. I'm just scrolling down to see what Sefer it was. It was called Yosef Tehilos. That was a Sefer he wrote on Tehillim. And here he's going to bring down three answers. The first two are going to be new to us. And then the third answer is a repeat of that Kabbalistic one. So we're not going to have to look at that one again because we already got that one. That's beautiful. And now we're going to see two more. So first paragraph on the left. Medina, Medina, Yer, Amru, Parakam, and Megillah, the Gemara says, 
Rav Yochanan Pasach Emesai Ro Kolafse Aretz. That's Yeshua Selokeno. We made Mordechai Veser. So that's what he's using as a jumping point. Is that it says in Tehillim that Ro is as Ro Kolafse Aretz. Everybody throughout the entire planet will see Yeshua Selokeno, the salvation of God. So the Gemara says, "New. When did that happen?" He says it was during Mordechai and Esther. Why? So the way the Chida is going to learn that is because, yeah, there were Jews outside the Persian Empire that recognized this too. That's what the Pasuk and Tila means. Kolafse uh, Throughout all the corners of the world, even outside the Persian Empire, they all recognized the Yeshua Solokanim. So he says here, How do we explain this Pasuk based on the question I once raised? The Kasav, Marimat, I, I'm, I'm not sure what that abbreviation is. The Yisra, it could be... Um, I'm, I'm sure. Okay, the Yisrael Shabbat u Mitzrayim. You see, here he doesn't say Africa. He says Mitzrayim. That's how I knew what he meant when he said Africa. That there were Jewish communities. There were, there were Jews who were living in Sfarad at the time of the Purim story in Spain. U Mitzrayim and in Egypt, which is on the African continent. Lo hayutachas rishushachas shverosh. And during this, that time, they were not under the dominion. They weren't under the rule of Achashverosh. They weren't in the Persian Empire. Bimkein lo hayolam lasus Purim. Therefore, it was never incumbent upon them to make Purim. So why did they do it? The Afshar Yashiv. So he says it's possible to explain as follows. The Kivan de Purim Kiblu Atora Baratzon. What was the awesome event that happened on Purim? What we saw in Perak Tess, it says Kimu Kiblu. The Jews willingly and lovingly accepted, reaccepted on themselves. So again, the Gemara says, what does that mean? Kimu Mashi Kiblu Kvar. They reaccepted what they had already accepted, meaning at Har Sinai, at, when we accepted the Torah, there was some degree of compulsion that God compelled us to access, accept the Torah. According to the Medrash and the Gemara, the Agartha, God picked up Har Sinai, held it over our head, and said, if you accept the Torah, good. If not, Sham this is where you're going to meet your burial, because I will drop the mountain on you. So there was some degree of compulsion that went on at Sinai. But here, we willingly and lovingly accepted the Torah, because we said we felt so saved by what just happened. Our Hashem rescued us from the threat of Achashverosh. Klal Yisrael had another Nasev and Ishma moment, where they willingly and lovingly accepted the Torah and all of its commandments. So what the Chidah is answering here is that when Jews living outside the Persian uh, Empire, when they heard that all of Klai Yisrael, based on their Hatzalah, based on their salvation, lovingly reaccepted the Torah, the binding nature of the Torah and the mitzvahs on themselves, they said, how could we How could we pass that opportunity? It's beautiful. Klai Yisrael is having another Nasa Vinishma moment. We want in on that too. So let's see what he says. Oh, the given the Bipurim Kiblu Ator Baratzon. Since on Purim, all the Jews in the Persian Empire reaccepted the Torah out of love and will. Yisrael Hashem Malchus Achashverosh. That's what happened in the Persian Empire. Achareim Negreru Kol Yisrael. So every other Jew living outside the Persian Empire says, that's beautiful. All of Klai Yisrael is having another Nasev and Ishma moment. And out of love, they're accepting the Torah. We're going to do that as well. We're going to recommit ourselves. So all of Klai Yisrael recommitted themselves to the Torah, even those outside. Because even though they weren't, they didn't, feel that they dodged the bullet because they were never threatened. They were so appreciative to Hashem that Achenu B'nai Yisrael, that the majority, the overwhelming of, majority of B'nai Yisrael was just saved. They said, we're so happy, we're going to celebrate and we're going to do another Kabbalah Satora, accept the Torah again. And because of that Simcha Satora, everybody took on Purim. So here the Chidah is giving a different answer. The Chidah is not getting mystical. The Chidah here is saying, even those Jews outside the Persian Empire who did not feel like they dodged the bullet, they still celebrated and took on the incumbent make, to make Purim incumbent upon themselves and make it obligatory for all their descendants. Why? Because even though they didn't dodge the bullet, they were never under threat. They heard what happened. And once they saw that all the Jews in the Persian Empire were reaccepting the Torah and there was such a celebration, they said, we also want to reaccept the Torah out of love for what Hashem did for Bnei Israel. Even though we weren't threatened, how can I not feel ecstatic that all of the Jews in the Persian Empire were threatened and they were saved? So they were also thrilled and they were tickled pink. And what do you do when you're so happy? You reaccept the Torah. So that's why they did it as well. Beautiful. That's his second answer. Now let's see a third answer. So this top next paragraph, Vaod, another answer. And what's so cool about this answer is, and Shal Shudas, when I spoke out this chida after benching, when we were walking back to Marev, Rabbi Gelb came over to me and he says, I thought of another answer. And that's what, exactly what the Chidah is about to tell us. I told Rabbi Gelb at the time 
wow, that's very interesting. That's real. And maybe if we look hard, we'll find someone. And then when I found this Chida, I was blown away. I said, not only did he find someone who addressed this question with that answer, the Chida himself offers Rabbi Gelb's answer. So Rabbi Gelb, I said, Baruch Shekivant, I sent him this. I was so excited. Matzah Shabbos, I sent this to him. So let's see what the Chida writes here. Oh, and furthermore, a third answer. If let's say, God forbid, Haman would have been successful in his plot and he would have eradicated, and it would have been doomsday for all the Jews living in the Persian Empire. Even all the other remnants of Jews living in other kingdoms, they also would have been at risk. Because then every despot, every villain, every hater of the Jews in kingdoms all over the world would have jumped forward and say, okay, he just laid out the roadmap for us. He was successful at annihilating all the Jews in his empire. We're going to do it in ours. So, so, so that would have inspired every other hater out there to kill the Jews. So therefore, he says, that's why B'nai Yisrael accepted Purim. Even though you might say, why? They were never at risk. In a certain sense, they were at risk. Because had Haman been successful in Persia, that would have inspired the villains in Spain, that would have in, in Sfarad, the villains in Mitzrayim, all over the world, wherever there was a Jewish community outside the Persian kingdom, that would have inspired them to annihilate their Jews as well. Therefore, even the Jews outside the Persian Empire said, whoo, we just dodged a bullet. What do you mean? You weren't under the threat of Haman. I understand that. But if Haman had been successful, he would have inspired the haters in our country. So therefore, they felt they also dodged a bullet. Therefore, since they felt they dodged a bullet, they said, we're also taking on Purim and all of our descendants as well. So three different answers the Chidah gives to the same question. And then the Chidah goes on in the next paragraph to give his mystical answer again. So again, what was his question again? Why did the Jews outside the Persian, uh, Persian Empire take on Purim? They weren't saved. First answer was mystical. How can we pass up this opportunity? Every year on Purim, this mystical energy comes down, spiritual forces, powers come out. I want to tap into them, to have an aliyah ruchni, to have a spiritual elevation. The only way to do that is to make Purim obligatory and then do the mitzvahs. So therefore, no Jew wants to mitzvah, mitzvah out on the opportunity to grow spiritually. So we made they made Purim obligatory and all their descendants as well. Therefore, every Jew has the ability to have that aliyah ruchni, to have that spiritual elevation of Purim. That's his first answer. Second answer was, that no, the, even the Jews outside the Persian Empire, they lovingly took on Purim. Why? Because of the Kimu Kiblu aspect, that they wanted to they wanted to uh, reaccept the Torah out of love. And, and, and that, so they joined in. And the third answer that Chidah gave is, no, they were under, they did feel they dodged a bullet. Why? They weren't under the threat of Haman. True. But had Haman been successful, that would have inspired all the villains and all the nefarious figures in their countries to attack them and come up with plots against them. So by the fact, Haman's plot was foiled. Nobody else even got off the ground. Therefore, they felt they dodged a bullet too. So therefore, they took on Purim. So they, they, in a sense, they did feel that they had been saved. There was a Hatzalah they experienced. So worldwide jury took up from three different answers from the Chida to the same question. Beautiful. I want to share with you now, let's go to the next page. On page four, there was a beautiful, beautiful story. I read this first. I'm going to, I'm going to jump the gun here. Let's first go to the bottom of page, uh, is that five? Bottom of page five, this is going to be a plug for a program that uh, that uh, upcoming Young Israel program. We know that Shelly Kotleroff has been doing a great job in her book read program that she's been picking. She's been selecting fascinating books of Jewish interest. Uh, she's been inspiring many members of our community to read these books and then get together to discuss them. And she does a masterful job of facilitating conversation and creating discussion about the important themes of those books. The next book uh, read the discussion that's going to take place is going to be coming up in a few weeks on March 21st, which is about two weeks, March 21st. And it's out of the book called Out of the Depths. And it's uh, a, an autobiography. It's the memoirs of Chief Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau. I love this book. Uh, when it came out several years ago, both Layla and I read it, we couldn't put it down. One of Layla's nephews was so moved. He was a young boy, a young teenage boy at the time. He was, I think, under bar mitzvah. He wasn't yet even bar mitzvah. He was so emotional. He loved this book so much. It was his passion. He wanted to meet Rabbi Lau. Rabbi Lau had come to America for a convention, something, and he was so happy. He got to go. They they took him to go meet Rabbi Lau. He just felt like he had to meet him. He felt so moved by this book. It's a beautiful book, and there are so, there are so many vignettes in here that made such a powerful impression on me. So when I saw this last shot, this last answer from the Chida, 
it brought back a memory of something I had seen in this book. And in fact, it's in the book. If you have it at home, uh, it's on page 241 and 42. If you don't have the book at home, by all means, go to Amazon and get this book. This should be required reading for everyone. For a while, we used to buy this book and give it to bar mitzvah boys and and, and bar mitzvah girls. Uh, it, but uh, th this this is it's such a powerful, powerful book. So I'm going to share with you a story that's in that book, but I saw it online. It's a lot easier to cut and paste seeing it online than to scan it in from the book. So this, and this totally, when I saw this last answer from the Chida, that Jews outside the Persian empire didn't feel that they dodged a bullet, it, it, it came back to me, where have I seen something like that before? And then I remembered. So this is an article, it was written, here it's on the Aisha Torah website, it was written soon after New York's mayor, Ed Koch, passed away in 2013. Now, Mayor Koch was Jewish. He may not have been observant as we think of observant Jews, but he was a proud Jew. He identified as a Jew. Uh, he really had a reputation in New York of uh, really embodying all that New York is known for. He was loud. He was brash. He was, he was, he was that quintessential New Yorker, but he got the job done. And uh, I, I think in general, I think New Yorkers were, he, were, were pleased with him. And he was a, an interesting mix of uh, what it takes to be a successful politician to get the job done and keep the city working in New York and uh, relate to all the different groups who were there. But anyhow, let's read this incident together. It's called Ed Koch and Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau. Mayor Ed Koch, who passed away Friday at age 88, understood that all Jews are connected. Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, the former chief rabbi of Israel, tells the story. And again, as I told you, it's page 241 in his autobiography. So let's see how it's written up here by Dr. Miller. Years ago, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau visited his brother in New York. He had a brother, Naftali, who was, uh, who was an ambassador or a council general to, let's see. So the two brothers were in Buchenwald together. Naftali was older than Rabbi Lau, and, and uh, Naftali kept him alive. It's in that book. You see, Rabbi Lau was a little boy. He was kind of hidden. He hid him in a potato sack when he went into Buchenwald, and they, he, was, he was kept him alive in the barracks there and miraculously survived while the rest of the family was wiped out. Rabbi Lau, following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, became a rabbi, continuing his family's unbroken chain of 38 generations of rabbis. His brother, Naftali Lau Levi, became a noted author and was appointed Israel's council general to New York. Ed Koch, New York City's brash, outspoken, overtly Jewish leader, asked Naftali to introduce him to the great Rabbi Lau, then chief rabbi of Tel Aviv if his illustrious brother was ever in town. So again, so Naftali is council general. He's in New York. He's got a relationship with Ed Koch. And Mayor Koch tells him, Naftali, if your brother, that chief rabbi from Tel Aviv, is ever in town, I'd love to meet him. Okay. Rabbi Lau visited New York and Naftali arranged a meeting. When Mr. Koch walked into the room, he announced to a surprise Rabbi Lau, I'm a Holocaust survivor too. Rabbi Lau turned to his brother in puzzlement. This was not the information he'd received about the American-born Koch. How can he be a Holocaust survivor? The guy was born in America, and he's much younger, too. So Mr. Koch explained he was born in the Bronx and grew up an American. He only went to Europe for the first time as a GI. I believe he was a World War II vet. Years later, though, after he'd been, or, or maybe it was right after World War II, he was in the occupying army. I don't remember, but he was in Europe as a GI. Years later, though, after he'd been elected mayor, he had the chance to travel to Germany as part of an international delegation of mayors. There he met with officials in Berlin and was shown various artifacts. One piece made the greatest impression on him, a globe that had once belonged to Adolf Hitler. It was on Hitler's desk. This globe was special. Hitler asked his assistants to determine the Jewish population in every country on earth and to write this number under each nation's name on the globe. Poland, Hungary, Germany, Austria. The Jewish population of each country was recorded waiting in Hitler's twisted mind for extermination. There was even a number one written under the city of Tirana in Albania, and Koch told Rabbi Lau. That lone Jew in Tirana was offensive to Hitler, even if he was worthy of being remembered, and even he was worthy of being remembered and targeted by the Nazis. It's maniacal. Next page, five. Ed Koch also saw a number under the United States. It was a special number, Mr. Koch remembered, 6 million, meaning that was the estimation the Nazis arrived at how many Jews were in America at the start of the Holocaust. I was recorded in that number, Ed Koch said to Rabbi Lau. I was one of Hitler's intended victims too. Ed Koch not only acknowledged and felt their pain, he realized their pain was his pain too. In his mind, there was no distinctions between him and other Jews. Meaning Koch said, if Hitler, and this is in the book, 
He said if Hitler was successful, if he had been successful in Europe and he would have eventually come to America, he would have wiped out the Jews there too. So he said, I'm a Holocaust survivor also. Yeah, I wasn't in Europe. I didn't go through the camps like you, but I dodged a bullet because Hitler was defeated. The Nazis were defeated. If Hitler had not been defeated, I would have been under his realm as well. Rabbi Lao realized uh, that Mr. Koch uh, was right. He was one of Hitler's intended victims. He was a survivor of the Holocaust too. And Koch wasn't just an onlooker. He was a survivor. He saw himself as part of history, as a vital member of the ongoing narrative of the Jewish people. One way to honor his memory is to follow his example, to look at our fellow Jews, not as foreigners divided by language, religious observance, geography, or the like, uh, or time. Like Mr. Koch, let's try to look at other Jews around the world and see ourselves. So what I thought about this was fascinating, is that what, what Mayor Koch was telling Rabbi Lau by saying, I'm a Holocaust survivor too, what he was saying was, is that, yeah, if Hitler hadn't been defeated, we were next. That's like the Chida's third answer. The Chida's third answer is Jews who lived outside the Persian Empire said, we dodged a bullet too. What do you mean? Haman wasn't after you. He didn't have authority over you. But he said, yeah, but if he would have been successful, that would have inspired all the Haman-like people in our countries to come after us. Since Haman was defeated, they never got started. So we dodged a bullet too. The same way Mayor Koch said, by defeating Hitler, I dodged a bullet. That's what the Chida is saying, the Jews outside of the Persian Empire, how they felt as well. I thought that's absolutely fascinating. And, and it's, 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 it's the same. It's the same idea. I think that these are three answers. These three answers of the Chida can give us a totally new appreciation to this aspect of the Perm story. And they also make us realize about Kol Yisrael HaRevim Zelazeh. We, Kol Yisrael, we're one body. We're all tied. It makes no difference that there were some Jews living outside of the Persian Empire. We all joined in, either because we wanted to access the great spiritual capabilities and opportunities of Purim, or we jumped in because we said, but uh, it's Kimo Vakimlu. We want to lovingly reaccept the Torah as well. Or we jumped in because we recognize we're all one body. We dodged a bullet too. There's no such thing as one Jewish community being uh, in danger and all of us being saved. If anyone was in danger, we're all in danger. So when they uh, were relieved from that danger, when the Jews of the Persian Empire uh, were saved, in a sense, we all were saved as well. So this all goes on to speak to us about the, the united body of Klal Yisrael and the great achtos that we ought to feel. I hope everyone had a wonderful Purim. I hope everyone was able to access all the spiritual energy that Hashem makes available to us on Purim. I hope it was filled with simcha, it was filled with mitzvos, and, and the, ability to, the ability to feel as one with all of the Jewish people. At this point, I'm going to I'm going to uh, stop the recording. And if anyone 